All right, welcome back. Next up is Darren Lacey, who's the Chief Information Security Officer for the Johns Hopkins University and Johns Hopkins Health System. Darren? Hey, you can applaud, that's okay. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Uh, yeah, well, you know. Uh, yeah, might, we might as well start off on a high note because it it's all from downhill from here. Um, thanks so much, for, thank you, Casey. Uh, thank you so much uh, for being here. Congratulations to the students for making it this far and good luck on, I guess it's Friday and Saturday when you go out and uh, uh, defend stuff. So defend well. Uh, and then uh, I, have a, I hope you have a good few days here that you learn a lot and you come back uh, if you're you know, a sophomore or a junior, come back next year and really wipe them out. Uh, it's, uh, I think this is an ideal setting to do uh, information security. I mean, it pushes you, uh, competitions push you. Uh, it's a, you can, uh, you really get a sense of what you're doing. Uh, and, and while there's almost certainly parts of it that are artificial, uh, even the artificiality helps. Uh, I, always, I, I always find that the, uh, the, the stuff that I didn't think was that going to be that helpful when I was a college student, uh, I guess the principal class that I apply now today that I took in college was sociology is about the best class I took for being an information security professional. I certainly didn't think at the time that that's what I would end up being because they didn't have those things uh, outside of uh, uh, DOD and the intel community. Uh, but uh, if you haven't taken a sociology class, uh, that's pretty close to the truth about who we are. And since you're going to be dealing with social dynamics, it's probably not a bad idea. And uh, I don't know if it's a good class in your school, but uh, it was in mine. All right, so um, today I don't really uh, have anything important to say. Uh, so, uh, so what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to talk about some things that are kind of, that have come to my, uh, to the top of my list of interesting things moving forward uh, and give me a glimpse of what this profession may look like in a couple years. Uh, and so there's a good disclaimer on everything. Everything I'm about to tell you is wrong, um, but I hope it's wrong in interesting ways. Uh, and I hope it spurs some thought, triggers some thought in, in, in terms of the kinds of uh, uh, things that interest you, because I am going to ask you to think about things and, tr and, and pursue things that you may not be pursuing right now, not just sociology. Um, so I ask myself every day, or almost every day, uh, after I wake up, is how do I make myself useful today? Uh, what, you know, what, it's, it's actually a hard question. Uh, and, and so the, the, top, the, the talk is about lots of data, and that we're going to get to that in a moment. And you, you have to understand that I didn't say big data. And I didn't say big data because I assume that people are going to be Googling security and big data over the next oh, year or so. And I don't want my talk to come up in any of the search. So I've come up with a new term, lots of data, or load. And, uh, and that's what I'm going to use, and hopefully no one will Google that. All right, so before I, go, before I go too deep into this, I want to throw out an idea about security, uh, because a lot of times we do navel gazing, where we say, what is security? You know, Bruce Nair says it's a feeling, and it's a, an objective state of affairs. And there was a presentation last week at R, uh, RSA that I wasn't at, but a friend of mine was, and then it got a lot of press, and it was done by Zions Bank on uh, big data and security. And I thought what was interesting about it was a quote by one of the, the, uh, 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 the essentially the smart firms, like Forrester or Gartner. Uh, they pay people to be smart and write papers, who said that security among other things, is an abstraction on top of the data that we already have. And I thought that actually that was a kind of an interesting idea, and it actually jibes with what I'm going to say. So I'm throwing that one out there at the beginning, 
So you'll just kind of mull that over and say security, because I've often said security is an abstraction, and we'll explain why in a little bit. But a security is an abstraction over data is, is an interesting concept, because a lot of what we do in uh, software development and in uh, computer technologies is we abstract over data. Getting the right level of abstraction is often the hardest part in solving a difficult technical problem. But first things first, we're gonna talk about medicine, something I know a little bit about, um, and later today we'll learn more. Um, there is a, well, let's go back a few years. Um, we'll, we'll start with the economics of healthcare. All right. Sometimes it's instructive when I'm trying to make myself useful to remember that there are a couple of essentially fixed and inelastic assets in the healthcare system. And one of those, one of those fixed and inelastic uh, assets is our ability to do medical reimbursement billing. Ooh, that, does, that sounds bad. So we'll put that one aside for a moment. Uh, in other words, Medicare is gonna pay what Medicare pays. Insurance companies are going to pay, roughly speaking, what they pay. And you're, you, in every procedure that you have to do, will have to essentially, if it, if it costs more to provide the procedure than it does your medical reimbursement rate, you won't do that very long. And the idea that you can willy-nilly raise prices uh, in, a, in, in a healthcare system just isn't the case. Certainly not the case in Maryland, where these are all set by the state. But it's not the case anywhere else, because so much of it is driven by Medicare. The other piece of it, and the less boring piece, or the conceptually more interesting piece to me, is that clinician time is the great inelastic, uh, it's an it's a, uh, upper, upper bound of healthcare. And I mean by that doctors, uh, uh, certain kinds of technicians, nurses, those types of things. Um, we, we have shortages of doctors and nurses and other um, uh, medical professionals. We do, we, we import them. We import as many as we can get, but we still have shortages, especially in primary care. Uh, we're not producing that many more than we used to. Our schools are full. Johns Hopkins Medicine, University of Maryland Medical School, they're not expanding their class size to meet the size of the U.S. population and the complexity and the amount of spending, which is 15% of the U.S. GDP, in healthcare. We have, in other words, a clinician shortage. And that makes clinicians very valuable. So for those of you who are still in college, you know, listen to your parents, go to medical school. All right? And uh, uh, because there is a lot of, I mean, there's, there is, there's a lot more demand for their services and growing demand than there are actually people to, uh, to do it. Uh, I am expendable. I am just a security guy. Uh, they'll, they can move me around. But a clinician, that's a certain number of hours, a certain number of procedures, a certain number of diagnosis that that individual can do. There's so much care that that individual can do. And you've really got to be careful about how much time of theirs you waste, all right? How much time of theirs you use. And this is actually an, this is actually an important part of understanding uh, uh, healthcare because we go back 10 years to talk about something called provider order entry, and Peter may talk about this later today. Um, but provider order entry is kind of a key piece in understanding what's happened to medical, uh, medical record systems. So uh, to, to put it another way, we have documentary systems. They are file cabinets, all right? The electronic medical record was predated by the file cabinet and the big paper records that, uh, you, that uh, many of you've seen in, in your inpatient or outpatient facility. Electronic medical records were modeled after file cabinets, largely speaking. That's a gross oversimplification, but there's, there's some element of truth in that. Order entry systems have become essentially rapidly deployed in the last 10 to 15 years, because they, but they're not file cabinets. They are workflow systems. The clinician orders a test, a, an intervention, uh, uh, a test for a test, 
and that is then distributed through the system. It actually serves a functional purpose, not just to essentially document everything that just took place here. All right, that is, the, in other words, it changed the workflow. And why this is important is that it changed the workflow in unpredictable ways. Because we looked at the problem and we said, is there anything less clear than a physician's handwriting? Well, those things get, those things, that can cause medical errors, lots of medical errors from there. Are there, uh, if they order the wrong intervention, all right, is, will that cause a medical error? All right, and so we wanna make sure that we have systems that can, that can, that can stop that. And so people were very optimistic, uh, again, the, optimist, uh, the optimistic view of software development, were very optimistic that they could develop software that would solve these and other problems, make things more efficient. Well, come to find out, a few things happened coming out of the initial order entry systems. One is that before we were distributing the labor among the clinician who would maybe jot something down, it would be validated by a technician and moved around and those types of things. We were distributing the labor away from the clinician. It may have cost more in terms of hours. It may have, it may have been inefficient from that perspective, but from the perspective of the limits, upper bound limits on clinician time, it was efficient. Moreover, we realized that a lot of the uh, uh, allergy um, uh, interactions, a lot of the medication interactions that, we've, that we thought would order entry would solve, they weren't solved, they were solved, but they were solved by throwing entirely too much information at the clinician. So they had to search and wade through a lot of information. So all kinds of rule sets and exceptions and risk management had to take place in order to make that fly. So we as software people, as uh, IT people, we came up with a solution that worked great in theory but didn't work so great in practice. And it principally didn't wor work well uh, because it, is, it took too much time from the clinician, essentially treating patients. All right, now we've done a lot to fix that over the last 10 years, and the systems are much better now than they were 10 years ago. But the, what a lot of people don't understand about healthcare IT is that we're playing with a very, um, we're playing with a very low upper bound. We can't waste too much of clinicians' time. So then those of us in security, we have to think about that a little bit, because in security, we're all about wasting people's time. We like to break things, we like to cost money, we like to add complexity, we like to waste people's time. Life would be much simpler if there were never, uh, in terms of going around, if there were never any uh, doors, unlocked, I mean, doors locked, uh, we could just go into any room. All the kinds of things that we do on the physical side of security, they slow things down and we get some benefit from that, but it's a, it's a different benefit than essentially the workflow side of it. So we have to be mindful, even something like logging into a computer, logging into a workstation in an examination room is controversial. Now, it's, the, the battle's been largely won, but in terms of, you know, do you, do you use card-based access, face-based access, all that is predicated, the, the, uh, our ability to deploy it is predicated on how much time it costs the clinician. And so you, you have to, you, you kind of have to feel that. In every, every time you go and, and you, 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 you know, you'll interview for jobs or you'll, you'll have a job and the information security person who's uh, on top will say, you must understand the business, something like that. They, they all say that. And, and that's true to some extent. Uh, you kind of have to understand the business. In this case though, you kind of, you don't have to understand, you have to feel it. <laughs> you really, you, yeah. And, and one good thing about that is that we're all patients. All right, and we want our physicians fresh, happy, and thinking clearly. And so we get, you know, so we're, it's a little easier to feel their pain that we dish out uh, as security people if we put ourselves on the on, way on the other end, which is on the, on the patient side. Now most of you are too, uh, most of you are young and you maybe are not as patient as often you are. As you get older, you become patient more and more and your sympathies will uh, uh, change uh, uh, accordingly. So the other component that's time bound limited is our ability to print out an accurate and correct bill. All right, how many times, I mean, you know, I, I, how many have you 
have had a medical procedure done, uh, and you walk in for the next three weeks, you have five or six letters from the doctor, from the hospital, from the, uh, from the clinic, from the radiologist, from the anesthesiologist, it just comes in, and, 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 and duplicative records, uh, envelopes that say, please, you know, that say you, got, you owe uh, $25,000, please ignore, you know, something like that, I mean, until you paid it, and you have to deal with your insurance companies. It's very, it's actually really a hard problem to actually get out to, to individuals, even who are covered by fairly competent insurance companies, uh, accurate billing records. It's just a hard, hard deal. And, you know, if we don't make any money on the healthcare side, we're gonna shut down. Hospitals throughout, you know, many hospitals in the United States, not many, a few hospitals in the United States, so the 6,000, a handful, uh, are closing because essentially they haven't been able to figure out how to meet, to do procedures and paperwork cheaply enough given the medical reimbursement rates related to uh, their either, you know, whether they get Medicaid or Medicare or what the, the insurance uh, that's available to them. I mean, it's a hard problem, okay? It's not a simple problem. And the way we solve that problem in medicine is that we throw clerks at it. You know, we have medical systems and we throw clerks at it. And we, we, what we try to do is we try to come up with ways that the best clerks work with the other clerks to make sure that the stuff gets out, that they contact the insurance companies and contact the patients. But it's not a minimum necessary kind of approach. People don't, when they say, oh, a new patient record, I, that one I don't work on, I better take a, uh, I better take a, um, a, a, a vow not to uh, essentially disclose the privacy. We expect them not to, we train them, we educate them not to, those types of things, and it, but it does happen. We are, we, have, we are swimming in private information, and we're doing that because we have to at the point of care, and we also have to in order to produce bills that make sense. All right, so I bring all that stuff up because it, to give you some sense of what, what our industry's like, but also to make you think, well, okay, that, that sounds good. But what's it mean for me? Well, I want you to go back to think about whether in order to be useful, whether what you're doing is worth the imposition on the system. In other words, step back from your, you know, or my, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say your, but I really mean me, my smug security nerd uh, hat, where, oh, 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 users are so stupid, you know, all that sort of thing. The, and, and, wait, and, and have a little more sympathy for them first, uh, a little bit. And then the second part of it is to say, is there some way to measure the value of forcing all the clinicians to log in every time they go to another examination room? What's the, you know, other than it's sort of received wisdom that you should do that sort of thing and it's in our risk assessment somewhere and so we do it, uh, what's the real value of that? Because the, on the difficult cases, now that one's a fairly easy case, but on the difficult cases, so for example, at Johns Hopkins, we have a department that right now is, they're wanting to use iPads for all kinds of interesting and cool things, all right? Now, I believe strongly that the folks closest to the point of care should have a lot of flexibility in terms of how they deploy technology you know, within reason, but a lot of flexibility because they're going to make mistakes, but that's okay, people make mistakes. That's part of how we develop uh, good software uh, and, and good systems. But I wanna give them as much freedom to experiment as they can, right? that where it doesn't essentially endanger uh, um, uh, patients first, uh, patients' health and, uh, and, adverse, and, and create adverse outcomes, but also, um, uh, with respect to privacy and security. But these are close calls. These are not simple. I mean, you can say, well, that app may not really be what I'm looking for in terms of it hasn't been tested enough or it has some, uh, some piece of it is sent off to the Amazon cloud and we may not have the right, they may not have the right encryption on that. I mean, there's all kinds of decisions that we as security people will have to make on that to advise our, our, our clinicians on how to do things. And but the decisions are rarely straightforward. And so it would be really cool to be able to have a little bit more data when I start spouting stuff off about, well, this doesn't seem like a reasonable level of security there. And the problem is that we don't have enough data 
Information security is a really immature discipline with respect to the data that we have to validate what we're doing. I mean, Microsoft just uh, did a paper a couple of months ago essentially reaffirming the value of the password. All right, so, um, um, and I'm struggling with trying to figure out what the relative value of the password versus other forms of multi-factor authentication. We didn't have enough data for it, at least in, in those terms. And we don't have enough data to understand even what's happening in our networks very well. All right, so the kinds of things that you're doing right now. But a lot of the data is out there. And it's, and it's hidden in a lot of places that we don't now get. So last week um, at the Zions Bank, um, um, and I was gonna talk about this anyway, but I was reading this uh, about Zions Bank. They were saying that they, that they imported per week three terabytes of data for their security team, and that it was breaking all their databases. So they had a big data problem, and they, went to, they used Hibachi Hadoop, and they started running MapReduce jobs against it, and, um, and were able to essentially glean things in real time. And I thought that was interesting, uh, but a little, I was a little skeptical. Uh, the reason I was skeptical is because this is what we do. What we've done over the last couple years at Johns Hopkins is we've used standard general purpose uh, computing uh, applications. We've essentially taken all the logs, used general purpose uh, uh, SQL report writing services from Microsoft, uh, Jasper, uh, Lucene, uh, we've used, um, uh, and we poured, we ported them into uh, 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 SQL Server databases and uh, little Hadoop clusters, although we're probably pulling away from that a little bit, uh, to other NoSQL databases to try to get, to be able to create an environment where we can maximize the amount of data that we actually are able to uh, at least ingest, and then what we do in terms of analyzing it. So we're, not, we're no longer just looking at firewall logs or IDS logs or IPS logs. We're no longer just looking at systems, uh, at, our, at our Microsoft System Center logs. We're looking at logs from, you know, that are somewhat far afield. We're, you know, we're, we're, we're much more interested in NetFlow. We're much more interested in the, in the uh, logs that we see from, virtu from our virtualized instances. Three minutes? Okay. Um, and, we're poor, and, and so we're beginning to bump up against the same issues in terms of the limits on our databases that other folks have had. And, and it, it is an interesting, it, it, it's an interesting set of engineering problems in terms of getting all this data in. And then once you have the data, it's an interesting set of analytic problems in making sense of it from an investigative and analytic purpose. And it's even a more interesting problem if you're trying to do it for real-time detection. Because when you're doing your thing on Friday and Saturday, you're not gonna have, you're not gonna have the pleasure of saying, I'm gonna run a uh, job, and then uh, tomorrow it will tell me what I'm, what's going on. Uh, in so many cases, we can do that. In other, way, in other cases, we can't. All right, so this, this notion of, 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 of a rich stream of data inside the environment that hasn't traditionally been managed or handled or collected by security is, 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 is a major direction in what we're trying to do. It's also a direction what other people are trying to do, even folks who have SIMs and, are, and the SIMs are trying to expand into that, the security event management systems are trying to expand to get more data in. You start to run up against limitations though with SQL databases and with the analytic tools. Moreover, there's other data from outside that, which is essentially, um, um, we get secular data from uh, uh, various research sources, uh, Microsoft, that are looking for trends that we have, need to be able to make machine readable so that we can make sense of it. Right now, it's you know, mainly human readable, but just putting it in front of an analyst isn't good enough for us. And finally, the practice of medicine is gonna change over the next few years. You're gonna hear this all the time. And one of the reasons it's going to change is because it's learning how to handle big data. Not just genomic data, not just imaging data, but actually workflow data. And I don't have time to talk about this, but many of you have heard of Facebook, many of you have heard of Google, and, uh, and you'll notice that over about 10 years ago, and not quite 10 years ago, actually in Facebook's case, but 
Uh, starting in about 2004, um, the, uh, uh, Google published the MapReduce paper, uh, and that paper discussed why they were using MapReduce, and one of the reasons that they were using it for click logs, click logs on the web server allow them to get discrete data elements that, t that explained, I mean, that essentially gave us an idea of what users were doing on their websites. And from that, they can chart out a social graph and develop a, essentially a profile. The click log plus MapReduce plus social graph changed, changed the way we essentially, what, the way they actually analyzed use patterns. They no longer had to just listen to what users said. They could actually watch what they did. They could conduct experiments, all right, in terms of, I can put the button over here, I can put the button over here. Which way does it, does it draw more users? And they were able to change the whole analytic structure. In healthcare, we're looking for, from a use perspective, discrete events, all right, that will allow us to see when a clinician is, you know, on a page for too long because maybe they don't understand it, they're making perhaps mistakes on certain types of forms. Uh, this types of data we're going to use to help physicians in decision management and in workflow management give them more time. Now, what's cool about being a security person is that we're already used to doing this. We're already used to handling large amounts of disparate data and running jobs against it. And we're continuing to expand that. So the way we make ourselves more useful is by showing everybody else in the environment how to do what we're already doing with some success, one hopes. And that's not only good for job security, it indicates that security will have an additional role and we'll maybe be able to get a little bit longer password next time. All right, I'm done. You got questions? Okay, thanks. Appreciate that, Darren. Next up is uh, Kevin Coleman. Kevin is a C, uh, senior fellow at the Technolytics Institute and an instructor with our good friends at uh, CypherPath LLC. Let's see if all this works now. Nope, that's not mine. There we go. It's up on the monitor, but not. There we go. Well, good morning. Hopefully you're finding this uh, interesting. My uh, little presentation is gonna be a lot different than what you've heard before. We're gonna talk about the creativity of hackers and why we continuously fall victim to them. And we're also going to talk about what I've termed security uh, absurdity in the way in which we're approaching this problem. And hopefully that will give you some ideas for your competition coming up. If you look at it, every time we have a security event, it points out either something somebody did or somebody didn't do. And if you look at the, the, all the stats that are out there, and there's, there's buku stats ab about this, the security events continue to grow even though we continue to put more and more dollars toward this. Look at the stats in, in the first seven months you know, uh, of 2011. It was 56% over the entire previous year. That tells you we're not doing something right. It keeps getting worse and we're spending more and more money on this. If you look at it, the healthcare industry is about $2.5 trillion portion of the economy. That's a lot of money when we have to protect all that. And it generates huge amounts of data that we talked about before. The company I was consulting to had to accelerate their movement to imaging and digital records. Look at the reason. The floor started to buckle under the weight of the paper. That shows you just how much paper is being produced still in our hospitals, even though we're moving to the electronic records and everything else. If you look at it, implementing electronic health records has you know, great benefits, but it also has some huge issues and security concerns. We won't get into all those. Everybody's talked about them uh, to nauseam. 
And that's what we do. We talk about it. We don't address it. Cybersecurity incidents, they're unavoidable. If you look at it, the year-over-year -year data speaks for itself, and the average healthcare institution has four breaches a year. Now, how many of those get reported? There's a great report that's going to be published later this week uh, over in the European uh, conference that says the government, when they, they looked at the government and the, all the government's uh, security measures and everything else, only 16% of the security requirements were met. 16% of what they said they uh, achieved and was built in, 16% were met. We're fooling ourselves. And that doesn't bode well for security. Look at what we're losing annually, $6.5 billion. Here's an interesting model that we put together so everybody can understand, and we've heard the previous speakers talk about patches and everything else, and there's some real issues here. You're sitting there in operation, there's a vulnerability that gets discovered, patch deployed, so that's kind of like the high-level process. The way in which we talk about the, the clock starts here when the vulnerability is discovered and it gets announced. 21 days later, and this is an actual incident, and this was a good, you know, real fast turnaround by the, the software company, they provided a patch for this particular vulnerability. It took the organization an additional 33 days to test that patch in their environment. You can't just apply the patch. There's all this custom code that's been written. And, and this may be a newsflash for you. When Microsoft releases a patch, they tend to break other things. Now, I, I will tell you this. I, I was a chief strategist at Netscape, so I might be a little bit jaundiced when it comes to dealing with Microsoft. So right there, you've got a total of 54 days from the time that we publicly announced to the entire hacker community a vulnerability that exists out there before you get, can get a patch applied in this instance. That's the way we talk about it. That's what we talk about exposure, that length of time. It's a fallacy. Here's why. This particular flaw was traced back and the flaw occurred nine years earlier and has been in every piece of software ever since. Every release. Now, if you think about the hacker community, do you think they just sit there and wait for somebody to release a vulnerability? Those are the ones that are lazy that the one speaker talked about. But the ones we need to worry about are the ones that are sitting out there researching and finding the vulnerabilities in the software. Stuxnet was talked about earlier. It used four previously unknown vulnerabilities in that software. Somebody researched and identified those four vulnerabilities. That's what we need to look at. This is the true model and the length of exposure that we see in a lot of cases, not the 54 days. Something to think about. This was an actual incident we got brought in uh, a Case officer from the CIA actually brought us in on this particular one. A company was doing just a phenomenal amount of research, and they spent years and years and years in this research effort. And they were collecting all this intellectual property. Well, unbeknownst to them, they had been hacked, and there was a cyber spy looking at the intellectual property. At some point in time, they decided that they would test this and actually, they decided it was a good idea, and they would hurry up and apply for a patent, an international patent. Well, these guys decided the same thing. They started their commercialization process. They filed a patent. Well, in the meantime, the patent was awarded to the uh, foreign country that fi filed for the international patent. These guys got notified, and just they started to take a look at this and said, this is too similar. How did this happen? They found the breach. Well, these guys started licensing the patent to everybody around the world, and these guys had to go to their board and tell them that those years of research and those hundreds of millions of dollars that they spent on this was wasted because they couldn't recognize the value from it. Now, here's why the CIA was involved. That particular cyber attack, 
came from my friends in China. Now, here's why they asked me about this. In some uh, cyber attack simulation, um, I did something that they found rather interesting. We intercepted the outbound on uh, that of a hack that was going to a foreign country, and it was also a chemical formula. Well, we brought in some chemists, and we asked them, how do we change this formula so if they try to produce it, it would blow up? Now, naturally, things that go boom is a real, real, real interest to, to the folks at the CIA, and when they tie that to cyber, it's like, wait a second, you're turning this, uh, a cyber attack into an offensive weapon? It says, yeah, why not? We can tell when information is leaving our system, and what do we do? Nothing. Nothing. How many people have heard of snort? It's a firewall, right? Protects on the inbound. We have trons. Snort backwards. We protect the stuff that's going out. We take a look at all the stuff going out to IP addresses and ask, why is it going there? If we haven't authorized it, we make certain modifications to it. That's being used in a lot of very interesting applications right now. So it's changing the model. It's thinking differently. And I want to commend hackers. I used to be one. I was actually Dr. Uh, Ralph Semmel from APL. I was doing a briefing here a while back. Uh, and he asked me when I hacked my first computer. It was in 1983. Most of you weren't even on this planet in 1983. It was over a 300-baud acoustically coupled dial-up modem. And it was an IBM 360 mainframe that I got into. Things have changed since then, but you know what? It's creativity that stays constant. We looked at the, there was a economic crisis, and we looked at this particular incident because this shows hacker creativity. And, and I gotta tell you, if there was an Academy Award, this one would go. They looked at it and they thought, you know, did, we need to target this and take advantage of this incident. It's got everybody on the edge, the financial crisis, housing is going down, you know, the financial institutions are in trouble, the mortgage industry is in trouble. So they carefully crafted a phishing email and sent it out to executives. We're talking the CEO level. And the email looked as if it came from the Department of Justice, and it was an electronic subpoena. And it had a link to the electronic subpoena. Now, 90% of the executives did what? If you're in their shoes and you're in this housing crisis and everything else, you're going to be a little bit on edge, aren't you? They clicked on it and they got infected. Now, of the remaining folks who didn't click on it, they sent it to their lawyers. The majority of the lawyers clicked on it and they got infected. <laughs> That's creativity. Look at that. How sophisticated was this? The trick was to get them to click on the link, right? Just think about it. That is really a work of art. They really did a good job on this. You know, backdrop to the competition in healthcare, I thought uh, I would bring up some real life experiences. Uh, and we have uh, been brought in by some critical infrastructure providers to give some advice. And we started to look at the, the healthcare organizations, and we immediately got sick. Security in hospitals is not where it needs to be by a far stretch. Um, putting proper security measures in place, doctors are the biggest problem. They don't want this. In fact, you'll see a couple of quotes in a rather intense conversation I have with one of them shortly. The medical equipment vendors, we, they, they talked about uh, vulnerabilities and everything else. How many people know that those complex treatment devices, the equipment that's in the hospitals, have wireless cellular modems built into them so that the people who manage those systems and can make tweaks and everything else that design engineers can call in remotely and they aren't obstructed by firewalls. Anybody see an issue with that? The chief information security officer didn't know those modems existed. We picked it up doing a wireless scan and we kept seeing these cellular signals and we didn't know what they were. That's how we found out. They went back to the vendor and they said, oh yeah, we don't want to have to deal with your firewall. Now, you guys probably don't remember the movie War Games. OK, 
could use an auto dialer to automatically what? Identify phone numbers where there was a computer that answered the other end? How hard is that to do? Software's out there for free. The cost of security compliance is breaking the CISO's budget. There was a new reg that came out, the CISO looked at it, said, well, that's just something else I can't afford to comply with right now. And he's right. There's a difference between security and compliance. You can be compliant and not be secure. Question for you. What's the difference between a medical doctor and, and a terrorist? Does anybody know? Anyone? Nah. Whoop. You can negotiate with the terrorists. <laughs> I'm not joking. These guys you can't negotiate with. I had the most intense conversation with an MD who swore to me, D-R-O-W-S-S-A-P, in all caps, was a complex password. What's that backwards? Password. Jesus. The auto logout function on his computer was a productivity killer. This is the mentality that we're dealing with, and you wonder why there's insecurity when it comes to our systems. Medtronic's insulin pump hack, you can take a look at this. Here's what really bugs me. This was pointed out over a year ago, and it's still vulnerable. The, the exploit still exists there. We've known about it for a year, and we took no action. Why? Think about this. One third of all data security breaches occur in the healthcare industry. Did you know that? Everybody's going after the data. The non malicious outside insider, there was a group of consultants came in. It was at the same facility we caught the wireless cellular modems in the treatment equipment. And we're doing the scan and we picked up a wireless modem that wasn't supposed to be there. And we searched around, searched around. It was hidden behind a chair. The consultants put it in so they could communicate. What's interesting was this particular organization, uh, where this was, was on the executive floor. Chief medical officer, the CEO, the CIO, chief legal officer, and everybody else. A very sense of conversations going on in terms of electronic email and everything else. When they plugged into the hospital's network, they exposed everybody. What was even better was their competition was one floor above them. Great. Just put it there so everybody can see it. How hard is it to see a wireless network and the traffic going across? There's network sniffers that do that all the time. The malicious outside insider, this was an individual that was brought in, hired by a very reputable placement firm. He was a temporary resource brought in the IT department, he set up a server and was FTPing massive amounts of data going outside. We caught him because we were monitoring stuff going outside. When we started to do the, the background research and bring in the FBI on this particular incident, we found out that this guy had done something very similar before. The organization that uh, we hired him through for a temporary worker never did a background check. Simple things. We just absolutely just ignore them. Medical school researchers, these guys plug the server into the network. Absolutely unknown to the IT organization. They put a wireless system in place. And look what everybody had the same username and password, and it had administrator privileges. Not good. Albert Einstein, you know, he's been around for a long time, and, and he actually uh, said, you know, insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. We're doing that in security. Just think about this. We have to know about the attack before we create the signatures that go into our security software nowadays. So an attack has to have, have taken place. We are 100% reactive 
to security measures instead of being proactive. You know, I actually had a different one up here, and I decided to change it last minute just because of where we're at. I actually, how many people have heard of a comedian by the name of Ron White? Raise your hands. He did a tour, and a friend of mine has his uh, tour poster up in his office. The tour's name was You Can't Fix Stupid. That seems to apply to a lot of the security events that we have. So this is where everybody here comes in. If you look at it, in the near term, we got to develop something other than signature-based security. And I'm a big fan of behavioral-based modeling. We started looking at this in security back in 2001. We've got to get to a predictive model rather than the reactive state that we're in right now. To address this threat, we're going to need creativity to be applied to this. And we don't have that creativity that's taking place right now. A lot of corporations stifle creativity. Just think about this. If you're in the major league and you're batting 300, you're not right all the time, are you? If you batted 300 in security, is that a good benchmark? No. In corporate America, they expect you to be right, what, 100% of the time. They don't give you the opportunity to try something and fail. But that's what we've got to do in the research, because out of failure, as the one uh, speaker this morning talked, that's where you get the real learning. So creativity and innovation. That's what we've got to have when we're looking at security and we're looking at how to build integrity into our systems. And security and integrity have to be built in. They can't be bolted on later. And that's what we do. We bolt on firewalls later on, antivirus, all that stuff's bolted on. We did a, a study that says, on average, in commercial software, okay, and this is software companies that produce you know, the, uh, the products, there's one error per every 10,000 lines of code remaining after all testing is done and put in production. All right? One per every 10,000 lines of code. Just think about that in the example that was given of the 747, the tens of millions of lines of code there. And what was uh, uh, Windows 8? About 62 million lines of code, I believe. Think about all the bugs that are sitting out there waiting to be discovered. We've got to do something different because what we're doing today does not work. So when you're going in and you're thinking about the attacks in, in uh, you know, your upcoming uh, competition, get creative. The same, th same old, same old is not going to be good enough to win this competition. Think out of the box. Think about the vulnerability of the people and what they're most likely to do and profile the individuals who's going to be using the system that you're going to be attacking. That's the way in which to get into these systems. It's not always technical. It's as much of a human uh, systems problem as it is a technical problem. So with that, I'll open it up for some questions, comments, concerns. I stand between you and lunch, so this is not a good position to be in. But I'm down here and lunch is that way, so I can't get over the stampede. Hey, yes, Kevin, sir. I, I'm curious if you think we can teach people to, to, to think like the creative hackers, and, and if so, how, how do we do that? What are ways in which we can you know, create this creativity in cybersecurity education? Creativity, I, I have to say, I think is built into the individual. Um, we can give them, give them the freedom to be creative. A lot of organizations uh, stifle creativity. Um, the two organizations uh, that I was with as chief strategist, the first was Business Week's 44th fastest growing company because of that creativity factor. The second was Netscape. We grew at 65,000%. Don't ever do that, that hurts. I had a full head of hair when I joined Netscape. You know, this, this, this came from going, Ew! things we didn't think of. 
So I don't think we can train it, but we can get out of the way of creativity, and I think we can make a giant step forward by getting out of the way of, of stifling creativity by not, you know, uh, celebrating every victory while amashing anybody who actually has a failure. We got to celebrate failures too, in some cases, because they lead to breakthroughs. We weren't right all the time at Netscape, and the greatest thing about it was we throw it out on the Netscape portal. What people used it. It became a product. If they didn't, we wrote it off as product development and research. So it's that continuous trial and error that we went through that allowed us to grow at that, that unbelievable rate. Other questions? Scott Dines and Eric Johnson at Dartmouth College did a series of analyses of how healthcare IT was used in a real hospital system. And one of the things they found was similar to what you described at one point, which is systems were, were keeping the medical community from doing what they're used to doing in a hospital. So they would do things like log in in the morning and just keep things logged in so people could just walk up to a system and do their work and then walk away and do whatever else they needed to do. So, <clears throat> so my question to you is, would it be more productive for those of us in security to try harder to understand the business model of how healthcare works so that the security fits more smoothly into what people really get rewarded for? They don't get rewarded for good security, they get rewarded for good health care. And perhaps <clears throat> if, we un <clears throat> excuse me, if we understood the business model, <clears throat> we would do a better job of not <clears throat> thinking of the users so much as stupid users, but as people who are just trying to get their jobs done. There's two parts to the, the answer to the, the point that you bring up. One is we have done a lousy job on a security awareness education at all levels. Uh, the executive level is probably the worst. And, and dealing with them at that level uh, is difficult at best. The second thing is, um, in our systems that one organization that I most frequent, I walk in, I put my thumbprint down, and it automatically logs me on and decrypts the hard drive. How hard is that? It's not, but we haven't educated them that they're not, we're not collecting their fingerprint. It's, it's a, an algorithm of, that, that's matched about my fingerprint. If you had something that was that easy and that quick, do you think the docs would be more likely to use it if we trained them on just how great this would be? Just think about that. How about, you know, we've got retina scans to get in these, these uh, high classified areas. Uh, that's a little bit more difficult, but now we're starting to see some breakthroughs in retina scanning that says you can do it from you know, 18, 24 inches out reliably. So now you don't have to put your face down in those little goggle things anymore. There's technology that's out there, but we just fail to apply it properly. And, and I think you're right. We've got to understand the context of business so that the security provides both the, the the, the level needed to protect the data and information that's involved, as well as not inhibiting the users from rapidly assess, uh, accessing these systems. Any other questions, comments? Well, yes, sir. You were talking about the vulnerabilities of uh, software and uh, having written a lot of software, I know that buffer overflow and that sort of thing are things that you concentrate on, but in what other areas do you see that there's a great problem with uh, software development and the vulnerabilities of it? I don't, th well, let me give you a Netscape example. When we got uh, new software developers, Carnegie Mellon, all the major universities, the high tech ones, we would have to send them through six to eight months training before we would put them on maintenance because they're not trained properly in our schools. 
The structure of their code is ridiculous. You could not put that stuff in production, it would fail. It's unmaintainable because it's not structured properly. So somehow or other, all the lessons learned from you know, the software engineers at, at Oracle and at Netscape and at Microsoft and everything else are not getting into the classroom. And what we're producing is, is just not appropriate for the level of complexity of the software and the quality that's needed in today's commercial environment. There's an organization out in Salt Lake City, Utah, that uh, unlike regular degrees, you can get a degree kind of like in Microsoft, where all your courses are concentrated on the operating system and some of their other products. Or you can get it in Oracle or IBM or even SAP, I'm told now. I think we need to move more to that type of a model so you understand the inherent structure of the code that you're dealing with and, and less away from the generality of this is how you put code together. Um, first of all, as a retired primary care physician who now teaches cybersecurity at a community college, I have an interesting schizophrenic pr perspective on this. Um, what advice would you give to students getting into this area? What's the best? I mean, you've given some good advice, but would you have anything uh, concrete you'd wish to say to these students to get them headed in the right direction to get this creativity going? Because I see it as a struggle between of control between IT and the, the user, if you will. Uh, I think it's more uh, of uh, control between IT security and the user and IT security and the business. Uh, the business doesn't understand IT security and IT security hasn't taken a whole heck of a lot of time and, and put forth much effort understanding the business side of this. So merging this together, integrating IT into the business process uh, and also the business discussions about, well, we need a new system. When is security put in? After the system's already developed, right? Somebody already wrote the code and it gets handed off and then security looks at it and says, here's how we wrap around security. Security's built in, not bolted on. The last time we tried software bolts, it didn't work well. So I, I would say two things. Number one, concentrate on alternate devices. I think we're going, we're, we've seen the heyday of the computer as we know it now. And what we're going to see is uh, dynamic networking of all these multiple devices sharing information rather seamlessly, rather than being standalone devices that we're, we're treating them as today. I think that's where the puck's going to be in a couple years, and we've got to skate to where it's going to be rather than chasing after it. OK, thanks very much. Couple thing, excuse me, grab my power supply. Couple things before you take off for lunch. So before, get this powered up here. So one is we are going to take a one hour break. Uh, for lunch, and I would be remiss if I didn't say something about our lunch sponsor, which is the um, Cyber Center at Anne Arundel Community College. Um, so Anne Arundel Community College was the first community college in the country to um, be certified by the National Security Agency and uh, specifically the Committee on National Security Systems, CNSS. Um, when Anne Arundel Community College successfully mapped their curriculum to the 4011 standard. Um, I, for those that were here earlier, I mentioned uh, some of the projects that Severwatch has been involved, involved in um, towards the mission of increasing the quantity and the quality of information security workforce nationally. And one of those early feathers in Cyberwatch's cap was a, uh, a standardized model curriculum, a, an applied associate of science and in information system security. And that degree program was created at Anne Arundel Community College. It was really the first degree program at the two-year level nationally, and it's become a model that uh, has, has, been, has been rolled out um, nationally. They also were um, one of the first six community colleges to get the NSA uh, Department of Homeland Security designation with, uh, for Center for uh, Academic Excellence in the two-year space, or CAE2Y, for Information System Security. There were six community colleges uh, two years ago that got that designation, and seven um, this last year. Um, so they really have been a leader in the community college information system security space 
Um, in 2010, Anne Arundel Community College established its Cyber Center as a resource to address information assurance and cybersecurity workforce development needs of local and regional businesses, industry, government agencies, nonprofits, and other organizations. Training solutions can be customized to meet the needs of a specific employer's workforce and are not limited to technology, but solutions address cybersecurity issues across the curriculum. Participants can earn credit degrees and certificates as well as prepare to sit for industry recognized certifications through credit and non-credit courses. Training is offered in traditional classroom settings, online or in a hybrid format. In fall 2012, the college is planning to expand its training capacity by opening a new center for cyber and professional training in Hanover, Maryland. You can see the phone number and URL up there to get more information. Uh, just on a, on a personal note, uh, Anne Arundel Community College has competed in all seven Mid-Atlantic Collegiate Cyber Defense competitions and they actually won the very first Mid-Atlantic CCDC Regional in 2006, um, which we held up in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. They um, competed, uh, I'm sorry, they took second place. Millersville won that year, Todd, sorry about that. Uh, they, they took second place, um, but they've, they've competed in, um, in, in all seven since. So they're, they're the sponsors of the lunch. Uh, enjoy the beverages, the food, um, their tables. Um, we'll be back in here at one o'clock for the rest of the program. See you then.